Well, if you haven't been following me or don't know, Ford lately has been plagued with problems in building their vehicles. This is a 2021 Ford Expedition, and the owner's got all kinds of problems with this thing from the day one. It was purchased new, and the tailgate's been having problems from day one, not shutting correctly. All kinds of warning lights have been coming on. Loses acceleration, especially when you're coming to a stop sign, stop light, and have to take off. Understand, the level of technologies in these things is insane. Now, this is a V6. EcoBoost twin turbo GDI engine with the infamous 10 speed automatic transmission that has three overdrives. It's not like this thing was made in Mexico. As you can see, it was made in the USA. And you can see it's rear wheel drive. But we're going to put on a scan tool and see what's happening with this thing because they're getting all kinds of warning lights coming on saying it's losing acceleration taking off at slower speeds we'll plug it in easy to find the plug see it's got a bunch of stuff front camera fault pre-collision assist not available comfy regular cloth seats that will last forever there's a lot of space in one of these things set up nicely and everything nice little blue colors and everything but the problem is it keeps acting up in lots of ways ford is quality controls there's no arguing that and this has had problems since the get-go this was bought brand new been taken care of it's just their quality isn't what it used to be. Expedition EcoBoost 3.5 liter automatic. So we're going to analyze it. Doing a scan. Yeah, I mean, they're well set up. They're going dynamically. A big old armrest. The cloth seats, but they're real comfy. Now here we go. You can see we got five, six, seven faults. But the other systems are working. So we'll start at number one. The driver's door module. Left blind spot warning indicator. That's why it's got some of these codes here that you're... Pre-collision assist isn't available. Look at the image processing module. It's got five faults. And they all say control module. Communication codes. As I said, these Ford Expeditions are extremely complex. They have many computer modules on them. And they are often known to get failures. Failure type 41. General checksum failure. Fault previously detected but monitor has not completed the determined state. So it's got a problem in the module system, but it can't determine what it is. All right. They're not building that great. Obviously, the software isn't that great either. The software should be able to interpret the stuff, and it isn't. We're going to try to erase these things and then take it for a road test. Got rid of all the codes except for this one code here. So we'll check it out again. It's that control module code we had before. Internal electrical failure. If you can't erase the code to do a road test, that means that's a problem that exists somewhere in the circuitry. The ignition's on now. It knows it's a problem there, even without the car running. So the control module could be bad. The circuitry could be bad. Or you could have a short in any of the sensors that feed this thing. So let's start it up. And since they were saying the transmission acted weird, let's take it for a road test. Now, people are always kind of whining about these 10-speed transmissions acting up, slipping. We'll take it for a ride and see what happens with our computer hooked up for data. I can already see when I go to reverse to drive. Did that clunk? Shouldn't clunk like that. That's off an internal transmission wear. I'm more a fan of the V8 ones. I'm not a big fan of these turbo V6s. They just don't have the feel of a V8. See if we lose any kind of acceleration going slow and then taking off. I can feel a little hesitation, but here's something that I find with these transmissions. Now turn itself off. I hate that stop start stuff. That's just a bunch of nonsense. But a lot of it has to do with the 10 speed transmission with three overdrives trying to get the best gas mileage. So we're going to do this. We'll push the drive mode button and we'll put it on sport mode. Now it's in sport mode. You can see the S there, sport mode. The sport mode will have much firmer shifts. You'll get a little bit worse gas mileage, but you're not going to get this hesitation when you're trying to take off at low speeds. So let's try it off here. We'll come kind of a rolling stop. It had no hesitation taking off then. So let's take it to our little drag strip. Low speeds, it's not doing any hesitation. Now, off to the drag strip while we're in sport mode. Here we look in the rear view mirror there. Nobody's coming. So we'll see how this thing takes off. Like I say, I like the V8s, but this is a twin turbo six. Shifts good in the sports mode, but they can talk all they want. This does not have the pickup of a V8 engine whatsoever. In the sport mode, when you want to accelerate, you can see it's not lagging at all. And since there's no one behind us, we'll slow down. Brakes work good, and we'll do a little rolling stop go. 
and there's no hesitation now just a tiny little bit shift in there realize these 10 speed transmissions they're a little on the squirrely side when it comes to lower end shifts even in the sport mode but the sport mode is much better it doesn't have any transmission codes it doesn't have any problem with the data it's just when you have 10 speeds even when you're in sport mode they're a little squirrely between gears but that's just how these things are the vehicle itself is pretty quiet took the turn signal off and even quieter but I don't like that automatic start stop so I turned it off so it's sitting nice and smooth and I'm not messing around with the start stop because watch we'll turn the start stop back on it's going to stop itself and we'll see what happens when the light turns green it didn't have that much hesitation going from start to stop this is a 2021 so it's not that lurchy like the earlier ones were I just don't like it I find it annoying, so I'm turning it back off again. Now if we switched it to eco mode, you can see the green down there. We switched it to eco mode. Now let's see what happens in eco mode. It had more of a hesitation starting up. You could hear it. So if you really want the best performance one of these, you really want to put it in sports mode and turn the automatic start stop off if you do want to get better gas mileage go ahead put it on eco have the start stop engaged so it'll turn itself on and off but me i just don't go for that driving experience myself it's much more drivable in the sport mode doesn't have the hesitation so i took it for a road test and the only code left is that one for the processing module probably rather pre-collision assist isn't working anymore as we'll check it as it cycles through itself pre-collision assist not available no this is an xlt which of course begs the question would i pay fifty five thousand dollars for this car no i wouldn't i don't think it's got the quality that kind of money i wouldn't expect or ready to have problems with a car that hasn't been wrecked or flooded or stolen or anything but in terms of how the transmission works it's pretty typical for these it's not particularly shot it's not particularly worn out they just have a tendency of hunting for gears which you can bypass using the sports mode instead of the economy or the normal mode now this thing gets around 17 miles a gallon in city about 23 miles a gallon on a highway not phenomenal gas mileage but it's a pretty big suv that's what you're going to expect which to me begs the question why does it have a v6 then it's not such great gas mileage you put a v8 and a 10 speed on this it's going to be all that much difference because this is a twin turbo v6 so it's a v6 engine that of course naturally has less power than a v8 but it's got two turbos which have a little turbo leg as all turbos do so you combine that with the 10 speed transmission that hunts for gear the driving experience really leaves quite a bit to be desired even when you have it in sports mode it's a little bit wonky but in normal driving mode yeah, it's just kind of funky acceleration is kind of bizarre i frankly would expect a better driving experience for 50 something thousand dollars that kind of money i'd expect more than what this is putting out and realize this thing is only two years old now it's having electronic problems and modules already imagine what's going to happen when the dozens of modules get to be 8 10 12 years old and start to go squirrely electronically on top of the twin turbo v6 gasoline direct injection eco boost system that this has very complex when they break they're very expensive and very hard to diagnose to find out what the problem is in the first place okay finally i got my hands on an electric ford pickup truck the f-150 lightning and instead of the horse manure that people try to tell you about how great this is or blah 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 this is a real guy he was smart he didn't buy the truck he's leasing the truck he's going to have it for a year then he says he's going to get rid of it what is the truth about it he's told me his experience so we're going to go through it using my machine and tell you the truth about one of these electric pickups as you can see with my gloves it's cold out side okay in the summer he can get 300 miles of range out of this thing if he's driving normal stop and go stuff now it's cold normal driving he's getting 210 you lose a lot of range now he doesn't have a house so he can't get a 220 outlet if he plugs in the 110 outlet into this thing it takes three days not hours three days to charge it up so normally he uses electrify america he'll put it up to 90 percent there then he comes home and he'll plug it into 110 to get it up to 100 percent and interestingly enough he carries stuff in the bed mainly and if he carries a couple thousand pounds of tiles or something for his work he says it really doesn't affect 
the electric range. The range stays pretty much the same. But he doesn't really tow because he said towing knocks the heck out of it. A pickup truck that you can't really tow with for long distances. There's a big negative point there. He's got 25,000 miles on it now and he doesn't have any complaints about the vehicle. The only thing he really had done was he got the tires rotated, but that's a story in itself. He took it to the Ford dealer to get the tires rotated, and when he's driving home, he hears this whoop, bloop bloop, and the back wheel fell off because the brilliant mechanics at the Ford dealer didn't tighten the lug nuts, and it fell off. I know Ford has a lot of problems with quality control. They're number one in the last two years as the most recalled vehicles on the planet, right? But in this case, I guess they should recall their mechanics too. They can't even rotate tires and put them on. They did have to give them another rim because it got all bashed up when it fell off. He's lucky it didn't scrape down and ruin the battery of the truck too. He didn't buy this thing. He's just leasing it. So in reality, they're not giving these things away by any stretch of the imagination. They got a bunch of them lying around. They thought they were going to sell zillions of them. Well, they haven't. They sold more this year than last year. They're not flying off the shelves to begin with. And in his case, he's going to get rid of it because he decided that, well, he probably made a mistake. He went with his friend and his friend bought a hybrid Maverick and now he's thinking, I should have bought a hybrid Maverick too. The only problem is Ford can't build the hybrid Mavericks fast enough because they don't have a supply chain problem with getting the hybrid stuff. And they're selling like hotcakes. These aren't, and a lot of that is because the Maverick is a totally redesigned small truck that gets phenomenal gas mileage and rides more like a car. And basically this thing is a Ford F-150 that's been electrified. Real truck guys want something they can tow, go a really long distance. They don't want something where they got to hassle about charging it. He came here and he said if he would have driven here in a gasoline, it probably would have taken him four and a half hours. Instead, he said it took him like nine, ten hours to do the same trip. It's just a giant annoyance and people in pickup trucks don't want to be annoyed. They want convenience, they want something mainly big truck like this towing stuff and they're no good for long distance towing. They can't go far enough because of the electric batteries, especially in the winter. I mean, look at all the range that he lost from 300 to 210 just because it got cold outside, right? And it's not all that cold now. Imagine if it's 15 degrees below, you're running the heater, you're not even going to get that. I mean, it looks like a Ford truck. It's not like a Toyota Prius where everybody's going to think you're some kind of tree hugger or something. It looks just like an F-150, except when you get inside and you see this gigantic screen. <laughs> that is a big screen. Hey, this thing isn't messing around. Look at the size of that thing. Like any extended cab, hey, there's tons of room in this thing. It's set up like a regular vehicle. I'll say, I'll give that to Ford. This doesn't look like a Tesla where there's crazy stuff all over the place. This gear shift knob looks just like a regular car. So, let's look under the hood here. Oh, look. It opens itself, isn't that convenient? But there's no engine. <laughs> it's a frunk. Of course, because it's an electric truck. It's got a gigantic battery on the bottom that powers the thing. It takes a while to charge it up. It made his trip two, two and a half times as long having to charge it up coming over here. I realize another thing about these electric vehicles. Sure, he's had no problems with this one at all yet. It's only got 25,000 miles on it. See all that junk in here? On top of there is the battery. A humongous battery. If you live up north, he's in Pennsylvania. I'm in Rhode Island here, right? They put salt up the wazoo on the roads in the winter. Eventually, enough salt and the slushy salt will get up and get in there and it will corrode the electrical system. That's just the problem with all electric vehicles these days. Now, if you get a hybrid, like the Toyota Camry hybrid that I showed the other day, it wasn't a plug-in hybrid, that has a battery in the back inside the vehicle. Salt water isn't gonna bother, right? But if you have a fully electric car, or almost every single plug-in hybrid, where you can plug them in and charge them too when they can go 50, 60 miles on electricity and then revert to the gasoline engine, those Hybrid plugins also have the battery on the bottom, and I see as they age, 
the salt gets in there and it destroys the electronics. Somebody told Elon Musk, why don't you steal all those batteries? You want any problems? Of course, it would cost too much money for him, so he's not doing it. There's the charge port, it's plugged right in. I mean, they're simple enough to use, it's not rocket science. So it takes a tremendous amount of electricity to push this thing around. Doesn't matter how much aluminum and fiberglass they use, these are very heavy vehicles and they are going to use a lot of electricity. He found out that what he spent on electricity driving down here, it would have been cheaper buying gasoline. They always said, oh, it's so much cheaper with electric vehicles. No, it isn't. Now, he uses Electrify America because he pays a $5 a month membership to use it. But if he went to some other fast charger when he's traveling, he said he has to pay almost twice. So let's say he bought $25 worth of electricity to get up to 90% with Electrify America. If he was using a different one, he says it often costs him over 50 bucks to get the same amount of electricity. Realize there's no standardization of these things. They can charge whatever they want. It's not like there's 50 gas stations. This is too expensive. I'll go to another one. Are you looking here? No, there you are. And they sort of got you by the short and curlies and they can charge you whatever they want for that electricity. Now, he wants to see what shape this thing's in. So I'm going to get my fancy computer out. Now I got to say at least look, it's got an OBD port like a regular vehicle, unlike a Tesla. It's not a European Ford. We'll do a standalone diagnosis. You can see it's F-150 battery electric vehicle, 110 to 180 kilowatt hours. Okay. See, it's going to do a full topology scan of everything. Electric vehicles, you need a fancy computer. So while it's doing it, let's look inside. I mean, it's nice looking. It's a nice looking truck, right? Look at that. It's 100% already. It was that fast. Now, it's probably wacky things. Let's see what the codes are. There's four codes. Off-board charger controller. See, he was at a station that didn't work. And that's just, it remembers the code, so we'll erase that. You're gonna get all kinds of wacky codes. He, he tried using one charging station and it wouldn't work. Supposedly Ford and Tesla have this deal to use the Tesla charging, right? He tried it with an adapter, it didn't work, and that's probably why he got that code. Let's look at the other crowd here. Battery energy control module. Let's see what the trouble code is. Hybrid EV battery voltage external isolation fault. That could easily have to do with when he plugged it in and it didn't work, so we're gonna erase that too. So it's got a problem with the HVAC system. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Let's see what that code is. Circulation damper motor. Well, you don't want to tear this dash apart, but it gets cold sometimes, those sticks, so we'll erase that too. And the last one is headlight control module. We'll see what those trouble codes are. Right headlight swiveling motor didn't swivel right. Oh, maybe it got frozen with ice, who knows. We'll erase that too. Gives you all kinds of information. Look at this, heartbreaking hysteresis. One meter second A2. Look at some serious stuff here. Powertrain control module. Can be all kinds of information. You can see just even the loading that is taking a little time. And I gotta say, it's got one big screen. <laughs> you want a large screen, there it is. But I like the idea the screen's over here, but your driving information is here, like a regular vehicle. And here we go through some big amount of information here. He wanted to see what kind of shape the battery system was in, so you can see there's going to be an awful lot of information there. Because these are all things to check. Module secondary faults, module faults or clutch pedal, there's all kinds of things that this thing is continuously checking while you're driving down the road. Internal control module, secondary module fault, off chip watchdog, frequent reset, chip watchdog mutual interrogation. Well, these things are getting to be something else. We're going to whisk through it, you'll see. Here's the kind of information these things have. Look at this data, it's insane. Look at it, it just keeps going and going and going. That's how much data these things have. It will make anyone's head spin. Well, everything was totally normal. I mean, the thing's only got 25,392 miles on it. Well, the owner just told me an interesting thing before we take it for a spin. They can remotely shut this thing down if you don't make a payment. <laughs> now, they can't shut it down while you're driving, but once it's stopped, they can shut it down so you can't start it up. So don't think you're gonna get one of these and not make any payments and drive down to Mexico because they will turn you off. <laughs> Ha ha ha.
Now, we can't drive like maniacs because 107 miles an hour is in. It won't let you go any faster, so we won't be setting any speed records. I imagine if you really went faster, it would run out of electricity like no tomorrow. That is one heck of a backup camera. I mean, look at that. It, it is a nice camera, but it feels like a regular truck. It's not that crazy Tesla stuff with all these screens and buttons you got to push. It's something to be in an F-150 that's this quiet. I'm used to rattling F-150s. This thing is quiet. There's no arguing with that. If you're going to a charging station, it's cold outside, while you're going, it will automatically by itself here warm up the battery. So if you don't know anything about charging electric cars, if the battery's cold, the charger has to charge the battery. First, it has to warm it up before it charges it, then it takes more time. So by this way, it pre-warms it up and you won't spend quite as much time charging it back up. Well, this guy's out of the way and we'll give it some gas. Whee! Yes, it does go, people. It goes a lot faster than a V8 Ford. Just realize if you drove this thing like I was driving it, you'll probably get about 75, 80 miles and you will run out of electricity because super acceleration wears batteries and motors out fast. They're great at lower speeds. We'll try the little acceleration again. Whee! Man, this thing goes. I gotta say, if I was driving it, I'd be charging it up most of the time because I'd use all the power out. It is wicked fast. You wanna pass somebody, step on the gas, and away you go, just like a roller coaster. Okay, so what do I think? It definitely is wicked fast on these. They're losing tons of money. They're probably losing something like $35,000 for every one that they sell because Ford is not in the electric business. As it stands, I mean, and an interesting vehicle, there's no arguing that, but they're not selling that many of them. They have real serious range problems when it's cold versus it's hot outside. And of course, real range reduction if you're towing. And what do people buy F-150s for? Generally, towing heavy duty things. It's got the power, but it doesn't have the range if you're really pulling serious things. 2011 F-150 that came over here with about 150,000 miles on it. All right, the F-150s are the workhorse of Fords. But like anything, eventually they break down. Now back in the day, we called them fix or repair daily. They're not that bad, but as they age, things wear. And in this case, I'm gonna have to eat my own words because I'm not a big fan of buying these extended warranties, but he bought this from Carmax. Yes, he paid too much for the vehicle, but he also paid two grand for an extended warranty, it goes up to 150, which this doesn't have quite yet, and he's had $10,000 worth of repairs done so far, including having the rear differential replaced. That's a very expensive job. They do go out but he had it replaced under warranty. I'm totally shocked that they warrantied and fixed it. The guy who did the differential said, now the transmission might be going out. If this doesn't fix everything. The transmission's the next one to replace. So he's brought it over here for me to check it out, especially to check out the transmission because this is what happens to Fords. It's a five liter V8 and a pretty good engine, doesn't burn oil. He got 20 miles a gallon driving over here on the highway, but the transmissions are always the weak point of all the F-150s, or really any Ford for that matter. But generally, you get around 150 or more, the transmissions start to go out. Now, from my experience, you like the truck, get a factory remanufactured transmission, and it generally will go another 150 or more. I do not advise having people rebuild them. Give you an example with this truck. The differential was gone, the guy took it apart, and he said, nah shot we got to replace it ford didn't even make them anymore but they found a brand new one somewhere and they put it in in this case ford still does factory remands of these automatic transmissions they're six speed automatics they are totally rebuildable now they're not the insane complexity of the new ones that have those crazy 10 speed automatics with three overdrive speeds now fords have always been this way transmissions are it's kind of the weakest with automatic transmissions but let's face the facts Hey, if you get 150,000 or something out of a transmission, it's worthwhile for you to put another transmission in. The engine runs good, it doesn't burn oil. The truck's still in excellent shape. There's no reason not to fix. As you can see on all that, it's $3,865 for a totally remanufactured transmission. 
which when you consider the price of cars, that's not that bad of a deal. You can find various prices for installation. It'll go anywhere between like 500 to 1,000 bucks, depending on who's doing the job. Or if you're handy with your hands, what the heck, do it yourself. After all, this isn't a four by four. It's just conventional rear wheel drive. Transmission's in the middle. You don't have to take a bunch of crap off like you do in a front wheel drive car where it's a real pain changing the transmission. And these, it's not that big of a deal once you get them off. And on like little bitty cars low to the ground, these are high up in the air. The transmission comes down. You don't have to pull the engine out of the way, take everything apart. You just take the drive shaft off, take it back. You get a little transmission jack from Harbor Freight's tools for a hundred something bucks. You can easily take them off, swap them out if you want to do it yourself. But regardless, you're still not looking at an insane amount of money. Heck, one of these things new is going to be in the real world anywhere from Forty-five to eighty thousand dollars for a new F-150. So <laughs> you spent like you know less than one tenth of that putting a transmission that might last another hundred and fifty. It's a logical thing to do because he likes the truck. So we're gonna get our fancy scan tool out, get this thing fired up, do an intelligent diagnosis. He knows what it is. Everything's loading up. Do a smart scan. Here we go, it's gonna go through all of this different crap that's on here. And while it's going through it, we'll check it out. Nicely laid out dash. Now it's older trucks, 2011, so it doesn't have any kind of big computer screen or anything, but it's got some nice power lead offs, all kinds of room. And of course the back seat, you could play a hockey game in the back seat. It's huge, they're humongous room in these things. Definitely a family hauler, that's what he uses it for, but he's worried about the transmission. So we're gonna look at all the data it's pretty fast. Now, BCM, the body control module's got a thing, so it's got a problem with the camera. We don't care, the backup camera. Camera module and hood switch, who cares? Clear those anyways. And we'll see what's happening over here. Battery voltage, that's typical. As they age, battery gets old, they'll often trip those codes. Maybe it's gonna need a battery, but uh, you know, that's no big deal, we'll test that later. What we're worried about is the transmission. Now we got rid of the code, so what we really want to look at is transmission data. Start it up. And well, look at the data stream. We'll be watching some of this transmission data as he drives. Normally I would record it and drive myself, but he's here so he can drive while I watch it. Him driving and me looking at the data. The output shaft and a turbine shaft. Now so far those are normal, so we're going to look at some other stuff. So far it's going smooth. Now he says it has the most problems first to second, so we're going to watch this data. It's commanded and it's shifting pretty quickly. Now you can see four and it went to four, five. We're going back into first gear. You see they all went smoothly. Here we go. Of course, now it's going smooth, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if there would have been a time lag in these, there's no time lag at all. Unfortunately, it works perfectly fine now. He wants to get another transmission, but it's not acting up for me. Up and try it again and see what's going on with the line pressure. Not bad, really, considering it's got almost 150,000 miles on it. Well, you heard him talk. He never floored it like that before, so he's babying this thing, and it is going quite well. Dead here. Output shaft speed reliable. There's no error in the output shaft, so it's not like it's slipping. We'll do another trick. We're gonna watch the shift RPM drop. Here we go. Now you can see it did have a little shift drop. As you can see the one was a little bit, and this one is still 21 above, and this is below, 0.75 below. Now of course it's not perfect, but we're talking about 0.75. So that's 75 one hundredths of 1%. <laughs> So, you know, we're not even talking about being off 1%. That's actually really normal for one of these things. As you can see, this time was 0.75, but the rise above expectation was 14.5, which is a little bit more. So it's wearing, but it's not outrageous. Just to check all of the shift solenoids. It's got six gears. There's a lot of data you can. And you can see the shift time from 10 to 90% is it's zero now because this last shift was absolutely perfect. So we can see that in the higher gears, it's more efficient, which makes sense because he was complaining of sometimes first to second gear shift. That is the biggest wear in your vehicle, first to second gear. So it doesn't surprise me that there's more of a delay first to second because, hey, when we went fourth to fifth, fifth to sixth, there wasn't any delay at all, it was zero. 
and that's what you're going to see. Backing up, there's no laps at all, so the reverse is working quite well. <laughs> he wasn't complaining about that either. I see again, the shift time is changing in lower gears. It's not perfect anymore, but you know. It's not that far off. It was like about half a second at the worst. I've seen them it'll be two or three seconds and then yeah. Then it'll trip a code but It being zero or a little bit over half a second. There it goes again. See, the early gears, the shift differential is more. It's taking a little bit more time to get into gear. Again, when we're at lower speeds, it's got more time that elapsed for it to complete 10 to 90 percent which really isn't bad considering it's got about 150,000 miles there's probably nowhere in hades you can convince somebody under warranty to replace this transmission the way it's working now unless all of a sudden it starts acting up as you can see now we're going faster and the differential is zero so now this shows the transmission is actually in pretty good shape he wants to try to get another one under warranty but unfortunately it's not acting up for me at all just that you know, less than half a second, and that's acceptable in any particular range. It hasn't tripped any transmission codes. And for me, it shifted pretty flawlessly. He said when he was coming through Nashville in stop and go traffic, then between first and second, it acted up a little. But truth be told, almost all of these things are going to do that with this kind of mileage. That's the biggest strain of your car is first to second gear, the acceleration gear. And that's the one that always wears out. A little bit further now he's done all the logical things to it he's changed the fluid the filter he even added some lucas stop slip to it and he said they all seem to do a little bit of stuff but it's still got that first to second when he's in certain situations it wouldn't repeat it for me and all the other shifts were fine these six speed transmissions are actually pretty good transmissions i'm not a fan of the new 10 speed it gets better gas mileage but man they have a lot of problems with those they're too complex so if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.